Hi guys, and thanks for joining us. We're joined again by the creator of uh, Shuro and all round gaming rock star, Alessio Cavatore. Rock star. Thanks for joining us again, Alessio. <laughs> so in this you, video, we're going to look at uh, Alessio's first expansion to Shuro, which is now in its second print. Uh, you've brought along the prototype, but it's actually on its way in a slow boat from China. Yes, I so hope that. They're, they're nearly here, but he's brought along the prototype, the working prototype for it. And uh, it's called Taranga, and it takes Shoro and turns Shoro from a two-player game to a four-player doubles game. Yes, you're right. It's not just a four-player game. It's actually a, a team game. It's two players against two. Sure. So what does... Uh, Taranga mean? We know, we know Shoro from the previous video where we looked at that, but Taranga, interesting name again, what does it mean? <laughs> it's Sanskrit again, uh, and uh, like we said in the previous video, the ancestor, the great ancestor of, uh, of chess is actually a game called Chaturanga, mm -hmm. which was played in ancient India by the Sharia class, by the, by the warrior class, as, as actually as a, as a training. And, and that again, because it was a team game, it was a two-on-two, -two, and it, the, the word means harmony. Mm -hmm. It's about knowing and understanding your teammate or your, the soldier you'll be fighting side by side by actually uh, without communication, without just, just instinctively. And this is what the game is about. It's about understanding your teammate and understanding one another without communication, without speaking. So it's, it's kind of like bridge. It is. It's actually in Shuro. Sense. Absolutely. It's like Shuro meets bridge. Really. Yes. <laughs> so uh, in the box, uh, now if you buy Shuro, you get your red, your blue armies, you get the board, you get the little uh, plinths or terrain pieces, uh, you get the dice. Now, what comes in the Taranga box? What's, what do you get in it? In the box, which is half the size of a Shura box, you would get the new armies, the green army and the yellow army. Mm -hmm. That's one step. Okay. And you also get these tiles, which you see that are placed on top of the Shura board. Yep. And they actually cut out a quarter of the... Of, each of, the of the playing space, each yeah. of the quarters, yeah. a quarter of the quarters, and they create effectively a deployment area. You see, this oops, this one is for the is for the yellow army. Yep. The other one is for the red army, the green army, and the blue army. Mm -hmm. And now I have to actually have this little note of color uh, is that of color quite literally, which is that when we were uh, designing this, I looked at the colors, the ones available for for, for commercial use, and I was like, right, so yellow, green, red, blue. There was something to these colors that I thought, you know, felt there was something I was missing there. Mm -hmm. And bizarrely, after a little bit, it hit me. I just went, all right. Red, fire, green, earth, blue, water, yellow, air. Mm -hmm. These are the four elements, the color of the four elements. And I thought that was fantastic. The mysticism of all the shapes and all of the, the symbols to go with it. It's very Masonic in a way. It has this... Symbols of, actually I added to the, after coming mm -hmm. to this realization, I added the symbols, the alchemical symbols of, yes. of the four elements to go with the, to go with the, with the armies. And that kind of developed an IP. It started to go, right, there's a certain mysticism to all of this, mm -hmm. you know, the, the synchronicity, the harmony, the going around in a, in a, in a turn. So, it's very mystical. It, it is. It's very, a, very mystical. There's a lot of harmony actually <laughs> to the design of the board game because one of the interesting things is whenever you're laying out the terrain pieces in this, by putting the four quadrants down, you actually once again end up with a six by six square in front of you. Yes. It's almost like this game was destined to be, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously the mathematics in this game are part of the great uh, scheme of the cosmos and mm -hmm. uh, it's ordained to be like this. Clearly. Now, this is just the prototype, guys, but you know, when you get the, your copy, the other side of these boards has an actual print of the, the board, so you can make up another mini board or something from this as well. Yes, you can actually, because there's four of them, you can make a mini Shura board. So effectively, by having the normal Shura box and this, you have two mini Shura box yeah. the boards, which means you can actually play side by side two mini Shura games, have mm -hmm. your own little tournament with four players, or play Toranga, of course. So is there any differences to the deployment or anything? It's, um, how's, how's the pre-game worked out? Well, basically, it's the, the, the additional rules that you need to play Toranga is fit in a couple of paragraphs, really. Uh, what you get is a, a first phase where everybody picks their army. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're picking your army, you will actually be maybe, uh, the, say for example, that the two of us are playing and yellow and green together obviously are one team and blue and red are the other team. Yeah. So let's say that the two of us are together. We would go and find a, a quiet spot where we can have a chat and mm -hmm. decide what pieces we're going to buy and what our strategy is going to be. You know, are we taking on that player or the other player? Which one do we think is a better target? And which mm -hmm. one do you think would be slower to come to his help, to his rescue? Uh, what are we trying to do? Are we setting up a trap? What kind of pieces do we want to buy? And then each one of us will pick an army. Exactly like in Shura, the difference is you will only have 400 points because obviously there's a lot of pieces on the board. So instead of 800 points, one sure board mm -hmm. will have 400 points for yellow pieces 400 points of green pieces and the same for the for the position okay yeah the reason why it's important to actually have a chat before the game is because like we said you cannot speak and actually you cannot communicate you cannot it's a communicate. very important difference here i have i have learned my lesson <laughs> uh we were playing this last night and uh, alessio says you cannot speak during this game and i thought fine he went off with the uh, or other opponent to to decide their strategy, and I came up with a very simple strategy with with my partner Justin. I said, Justin, when they come back and they deploy, I will tap on which side we think is going to be the softest. <laughs> and it turns out today, when I said when I explained my strategy to Alessio, he said, "You cheat! No wonder you won." <laughs> well, it all comes probably to my fault. I said, "Not speaking about the game." I should have said not communicating about the game, and the rules are quite clear. I mean, they rule out even telepathy. You cannot yes. really communicate. And so we can't even use telepathy. I'm sorry. Terrible. So we, uh, you have the four pieces. Uh, how do you decide who goes first? Once you pick the army uh, and you set up the terrain, which is done like in Shura, like you pointed out, there's a 6x6 six six in front of you, so mm -hmm. you just roll again, 6, 6 with a d6, so it, it just works the same way. Uh, what happens, obviously the terrain is denser because there's less open space, because these actually block movement as well, it's like a gigantic plinth if you want. Yep. Uh, so the, uh, the terrain will be denser and we'll set it up just like Insura. Uh, like Insura, we'll roll the dice to see which one of the players will start to deploy and the rules are the same. So you start mm -hmm. down, down a king and then we go around the table and people will pit down in turns, the king first, then the other pieces to fill the back row and then they can go up. And, uh, and fill up the, the second row, pawns will go last to the front. It's exactly the same as a sure. That's why it not, doesn't need pretty much any, any extra rules. Uh, the, the one extra rule that I had to kind of clarify in a way is where you get promoted. Because mm -hmm. obviously your pawns from here will advance and clearly it quite obviously will be promoted when they reach your allied area. Yeah. The other place where you get promoted is actually this three squares in both of mm -hmm. the opponent's areas. In a way, it's very simple. It's about when you get, when your pawn could, would be able to simply walk off the table, it gets promoted, it yes. becomes a queen. So uh, how do you get there? Well, you get there if you can take some pieces and move diagonally. Obviously, mm -hmm. you cannot normally just move diagonally. So that's, there's that extra rule. Well, it's not a, an extra rule. It just explains how promotion works. Yeah, a clarification. A clarification. And, uh, but it's on the opponent's edge. Okay. No, it's on your partner's edge, on or or any edge, if you can get edge, to it. Including yes. your partner's edge. Yeah. yeah, your partner's edge, so the yellow pieces, for example, can promote on the green area, the deployment area, or in these three bits, they're basically facing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing, that actually this is an extra rule, uh, you remember like I killed uh, Castling in, yes. in Shura? Well, it's kind of come back a bit. So if I say, for example, that uh, mm, your pieces and, uh, and your allied pieces, uh, pawns, are actually advancing to try to get to the, to the queen position. Say, for example, that goes there. So all of a sudden, they are blocked by the teammate. Mm -hmm. and you go, that sounds strange. Because the, yeah. the blue pawn wants to go that way, the red pawn wants to go that way to become a queen, yeah. but suddenly they cannot because there's, there's a friend in front of them. That sounded wrong. That just felt wrong. So what we did is just add this castling move. So either player, at any point, in that position, can just announce, well, swap. I call it mm -hmm. a back-to-back -back move. Imagine he's in a the battle, they're kind of twisting around, and you just swap positions. That's a move. Just like, like a castling move is where you move two pieces at the same time. Yeah. Do you communicate to do that, or do I just one decide? Player, one player says, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's his move. You don't communicate, you just announce it and do it. Uh, obviously, it would become obvious if two pawns are, setting, are sitting in front of each other that some, sometimes somebody will do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they are free to, of course, just normally to continue to move and become queens. Is, it, ju is it just the pawns? I couldn't yes. then do it again with the bishop. Just the pawns. Yeah, because bishops and everything else have the means to move around Absolutely. each other. 
whereas pawns don't. We'll just keep headbutting and <laughs> not go anywhere. So we have a scenario set up, okay, and obviously there's a, it's a four-player game, so Alessio and myself are going to partner up, and Lloyd, and oh, who will we get to partner with Lloyd? You! Yes, <laughs> you will be my You'll partner. You'll do! Put that down. Put, put, put that down, pay attention. Right, now we've got your attention. Alessio, I believe it was your move. It was, so <laughs> now look at <laughs> look at this. So for example, uh, it's my move, and I will, for example, move advance my pawn here. And then it floats. Okay. Um, I think I'm gonna move my bishop to here. Oh. So that's a, an interesting move, because actually what it's doing, and I will have to tell that, that yeah. I've announced that, Oh, yes, that puts you in check. And I look at this huge diagonal, and yes, my king is under check. And now, this will give you a good idea of what all, Turanga is all about. Turanga mm -hmm. is all about understanding messages like this from your teammate and getting the idea that, okay, my teammate has put this player under pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, the yellow pieces will not move next turn because I have to parry that check. Yeah, you have to pay as much attention to your teammate's moves as the enemy. Absolutely, because he is telling you something. It's the only way he can actually tell you things. And sometimes you will see him doing a move, apparently a suicidal move. It's like, yeah. why are you throwing your bishop there? You're going to lose it. But then you think, wait a second, yeah, my he partner is not stupid. Why is he sacrificing the he's bishop? Maybe, he's mm. maybe laying a trap. Like in this case, for example, you would be threatening my king. It's not a sacrifice, but it's an attack. And obviously, in a normal game, I would simply move aside or put something in the way. So it's easily parried. However, it sends to the blue player, and yeah. very, to you, <laughs> but sending you a good message, as in, yellow pieces, yellow king is under threat. So, but before we get there, I get a move. That's now, right. being Alessio's partner, I would obviously try to see if I can help him out. I can't. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a pawn. Because <laughs> I like taking pieces. <laughs> well, it's a very important thing you pointed out, as in, if the, the enemy, the opposition is very good at synchronizing attacks, my only hope, because I would be hit by two moves against by one move, so that actually is devastating on a chess set. So the only hope I have to tackle that kind of tactic is actually for my partner to see it happening and do something that will prevent them from, from, take, from absolutely exploiting that tactic. For, for example, you could have put blue under pressure. Mm. You could have put pressure on blue so the blue wouldn't be able to actually do anything about it because it was himself under pressure. Yeah. So because it didn't, now it's blue turns to move, so it's your turn to move. So what would you like to move? Your turn. Think yeah. about it. Don't let me down. What would you do? <laughs> okay, so you've had enough time to think about it. What move would you make? Alessio, do you want to enlighten us? What, what, would, the, what would be a good move for the blues? Well, if I was blue, one of the things I could do, potentially, is that. That is, seems like a very fairly innocent move, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because, like, what, what's the big deal? The queen can just get out of the way. It, it's not a big threat. However, of course I've done that. Blue would do that because he knows that this yellow will not be able to move his queen. Yeah. Yellow will have, by the rules of chess, unless he wants to lose the game, and actually when one king goes, the other, the other side surrenders. So you just need to checkmate one of the two kings. Yeah. Then what happens? I have to move the king. I have no choice. Yeah. So I'll have to do something or protect the king. Protect the king by interrupting the check or mm -hmm. just moving aside, getting him out of trouble. I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And blue knew that. So when the move goes back to blue, it will be able to take the queen. Now the only chance we would have would be that if I, as Alessio's teammate, could find some way of putting pressure on him to stop him from making that move. Absolutely. But you know, the way my pieces are, and, you know, my inferior brain, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so, you know, Alicia, your, your queen's dead. My queen is dead, exactly, unless you can do something about it, but knowing that red could actually start putting pressure on you because it moves before you. So it's all, Turanga is really all about that. It's about getting the double whammy mm -hmm. against one side while at the same time trying to prevent his, his teammate to, to help him. Now, again, you could play this with a chess clock. Okay, you don't get a four-player chess clock, but you could have time per team. Absolutely. And just uh, click and go that way to try and yeah. put a bit of pressure on to make sure that nobody procrastinates too much. But is it worth putting pressure on one king as a distraction? If you guys got very busy trying to defend the yellow king. 
is there the possibility you get distracted and leave the other one open? Yeah, because so there's all kinds of kind of tactics and bluffing and all kinds of things in play. Moving my bishop to here put that king under pressure, but it also kind of puts this one under pressure in so much as if the moves panned out, I could move this across because you guys are still moving bits to, to mm -hmm. avoid being taken. And then I could take, oh, yes, I could go into there. Well, yeah. You can basically reflect the attack into, into, into green. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. there, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that can happen. It's a very, very complex and a very actually kind of colorful game, which, uh, frankly, we haven't explored fully yet. So no. it'll be interesting to see what, uh, no. what it turns up. Well, guys, that's, uh, that's a look at Turanga. Alessio, anything to add on Turanga? Well, Turanga will, as I said, will, is, is on its way to yeah. Europe. It will arrive very soon. Uh, as we said before, there will be expansions further after this, and one has extra terrain, which we described. The other one is extra a combat system, which will use D12s, I think. And the reason for that, again, is a yes. Now that that is interesting. Well, let's before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about the terrain because if you haven't seen the last video, uh, currently the terrain are these plinths, and basically they block your passage. Except if you're a knight, you can land on top. But you plan on taking that. You know, another level, really, where you, you start to have forest, where only the small pieces can go oh, into yep. or go through. Uh, you're going to have lakes where nothing, including knights, can go into it. Um, you're thinking of having even swamps where you have to take a, a test to be able to pass through it. Yep. Um, so you know, that I can see really throwing the cat among the pigeons in terms of how this game's played because it, it just it, it starts to shake things up even more because even the very terrain pieces can have an effect on the game. Absolutely. And because of the four elements links to, to, <laughs> to Turanga, one of the other terrain pieces that we'll, we'll see the, the light in, in that expansion will be elemental gates. Ah. So say for example there's an area, a locus of fire there, a gate of, to the elemental plane of fire, mm -hmm. just there. And whenever you place one of those, you will have another one in another place of the board, randomly placed mm -hmm. as usual. And of course, a red piece, a fire piece, will be able to either, if it, if it lands on one of the gates, will suddenly have a chance of either moving normally mm -hmm. or teleport from that point to the other gate straight away as a move. So a little bit of mysticism, a little bit uh, of magic that's, into the system. That's cool because it starts to give each faction its own little uniqueness. Absolutely. Yeah, and you, you start to see how the earth, fire, wind and water can start to come to play in this. And then finally, you're, you're also talking about at the moment, you're in the process of designing a combat system, which is basically taking the whole chess thing and turning it on its head. So at the moment, as you had clearly said in the previous video, the attacker always wins. Yep. So I, I have a pawn, I could be attacking a queen, I'll always win. But with a combat system, that could be, that could be something quite, quite different now. Any, can you give us any thoughts on how that's going to work? Yes. Well, as I said before, uh, it's going to be simple. It's going to be um, actually based on D12s. And mm -hmm. the reason why I go for the D12 again is uh, part of that mysticism. <laughs> I cannot stop myself. <laughs> I have to put that in. Uh, this time goes down to Plato. Plato. Plato, in his Plato. philosophy treatise, uh, what he said, he associated to each of the elements uh, a shape, a solid mm -hmm. shape. And uh, people that play role-playing games will be very familiar with these shapes because they are effectively the, the dice that are used in, uh, in role-play. So, for example, starting from the D4, the tetragon. Mm -hmm. The tetragon is actually the symbol of fire, according to Plato. You can see the, the pointing towards, towards the, you know, up to the sky, which are like flames would go mm -hmm. up. So that's one. Uh, then there would be earth. And I think it's fairly easy to understand which, of, which solid is the symbol of earth. It's got to be what a D8 or something solid, oh, immovable. A D6, <laughs> a, a yes. Cube. The cube. The cube would be the symbol of Earth. Stony, heavy, immovable. Mm -hmm. And then you have the D8, like you mentioned, which is actually the symbol of air, mm -hmm. in the sense that it is bipolar. It goes up and down. It floats. Yeah, yeah it's light. And finally, the other solid is the D12. Sorry, D20 for water. Think mm -hmm. of the of the ripples of the of the surface. Yeah, yeah. around the same. Uh, but Plato was obviously uh, it could fit all these elements with the with the dice. I'm, I'm not talking about the D10 because actually it's not a platonic perfect solid because it's all these dice you can rotate and they always are the same. They are mm -hmm. the same from any angle. But actually, 
a d10 has a polarity. It's actually is not symmetrical effectively, so it doesn't actually count. It's not one of them. But the d12 is. It's always the same, whatever you like it. So mm -hmm. it's a perfect shape. It's a, what we call a platonic solid. However, there is no fifth element. And that's where Plato went, okay, well, uh, mm, I don't know what to do with this fifth element, which has a, was made of a pentagon, five, like, five sides to it. Mm -hmm. And so he called it ether or uh, you know many different philosophers have called it different things for the centuries for like some it was love or love soul, harmony or yeah. harmony or the, the things that keeps the element together uh -huh. if you've seen the movie the fifth element like, that was love wasn't yeah. it yes was, she was the the perfect <laughs> perfect creature so i think it's just cute to use the, the the d12 because that would be a symbol of not belonging not belonging to any of the elements but bring them all together anyways enough mysticism the way this will work, for example, let's say that is Green's turn and you're attacking that rook. So you decide you want to take on that rook and you send your rook in. Mm -hmm. so, so you will just, no, we just, we will leave it there and just okay. say the rook is attacking this rook. So yep. that's the, the area where we're focusing the attack. Okay, yeah. So uh, each piece will have a value and a number mm -hmm. of dice that it was able to roll. A lowly pawn will have only one dice. Mm -hmm. Then the, the knight and the bishop, which are worth the same, will have two dice. Mm -hmm. A rook is stronger, heavier, three dice. The queen, four dice. Mm -hmm. that, uh, the, the king, I think it will be one. It will mm -hmm. be kind of on, on par with, with, a, little, with a little pawn. Uh, what we'll do then is, well, you're worth three dice. Mm -hmm. I'm worth three dice. So it seems a very fair combat. However, you have a friend there mm -hmm. that is attacking the same square. So you get an extra dice, what we call a support. Yeah. yeah so other pieces have an influence on how the fight if goes. If they can mm -hmm. attack that area. Because again, it's like in chess, you always pile a lot of firepower on the same area and the guy mm -hmm. that gets more firepower there normally gets to take. Well, in this case, you have a first attacker that is risking his life because obviously he could lose the fight. Yeah. And actually, f friends that are not risking their lives but are helping. Mm -hmm. So you will have three dice for before the main attack. The king will give you, so this will give you a support attack, so four dice. I'll also give an extra dice if you are the attacker, so mm -hmm. just to encourage people to be <laughs> aggressive and give you an advantage, so call it a charge bonus or something yeah. like that. That's so, a really interesting dynamic now you've, you've said it that way because it really makes you think, oh, if I move this piece to here, if I move this other piece to here, I can be backing it up. And that works in defense as well. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you look here, we say three plus one for charging, four, five, that's the attacking mm -hmm. number of dice. The yellow is not able to, to help, mm -hmm. but blue is. That knight mm -hmm. is actually attacking or rather defending that. So mm -hmm. this is three dice plus a defense from, from that knight, which mm -hmm. obviously is threatening the same square. He's yep. helping his friend. So it would be a three, four, five dice versus four. We will roll the dice and there would be like special results. Of course, it would be a special mm -hmm. dice with different dolls and stuff. So I, I haven't worked out that part yet, <laughs> but <laughs> that's the idea. It would be a comparing of results and stuff. So the, the that, that brings a whole new layer to it because you, know, you would also be very careful about what you would choose as your attacking piece. Because if I'm declaring that this is my attacking piece, because if I win the combat, I want him there, but I could quite equally turn around and say, well, actually, no, I'm declaring my queen as the attacking piece and start with my four dice get a bonus for him, five and whatnot. I might be more sure of winning the combat, but I may not want my queen there yes, at or the finish you, up. So. Or on the other end, yes, you're stronger, but if the dice betray you, then you would be losing a queen as opposed to lose your rook. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're gambling. Yeah, of course, putting more firepower, but higher it, risk. It's a very clever idea because when I first thought about mm, combat in this, I thought, yes, but it takes away from the whole movement side of things, but that brings it all back in but yeah. your movement is very, very important. It is important mm -hmm. to point out that this will not be a rule that you have to use. Okay. Uh, of course, like the extra terrain, like Turanga, in fact, like all the expansion to Shura, this is all optional. You can decide to play Turanga with the extra terrain, but not mm -hmm. the combat system, or with the combat system and not the extra terrain, or just use the, the combat system for normal Shura and then not play Turanga. So it's all interchangeable. Do whatever you like. Play okay, the game yeah. you like. Yeah? It's an option. I think when you get, to, when you get uh, Shura and these expansions, it's going to be like... One of those uh, board games where it's 50 games in one. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to have so many options, but the beauty of it is it's not aimed at kids. It's aimed at us adults with superior brains. <laughs> well, the way I l I'm thinking about this and the way I li like to think about this, it, Shura is your starter set. Yes. Yeah? It's where you start. It gives mm -hmm. you a good game that you can play. It's fantastic. However, there's a lot more coming. There's a system. It will develop into more. Yeah? More elements will be brought in. At some stage, we might start to play around with the pieces and what they do, and maybe different shapes and sculptures. Mm -hmm. 
maybe in the future we'll we'll look at that yeah but you know it, but it's the beginning it's good because it, it it reignites your passion for the game oh something something news out but the other thing about this is and this is the interesting thing and it's only just occurred to me live while we're recording alessio this is not only a board game this is the potential to be a hobby and it, 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 of course, it's obvious now, somebody with such a background in the hobby industry, that where this is leading, this is, it has the potential to be a hobby. It's something that you, you enjoy playing and you enjoy adding to and, and growing. Uh, some people have already started to do uh, sculpting models, actually converting models, turning them into chess pieces and preparing sets of plastic mm -hmm. chess. Uh, I've seen there's a person in the US that actually made an olive tree version of Turanga. Sorry, not sure. I made oh, sure a sure of version to give to her, to her dad as, as a gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the pictures on our Facebook group. That is just some, a beautiful thing that she made. We'll put, the, we'll put the link to the Facebook group in the show notes. We'll have a link to River Horse in the show notes as well. Okay. So that's a, that's a look at Turanga. I loved it. Yeah. I thought this game was great. We had some really good fun with this. I think it's nice to be able to have a four-player game. You know, and you know, just to have partners, you know, it's uh, it takes Shuro and makes it sociable. It's like sociable yeah. Shuro. It brings it to another level, and you can play with three players. Yeah, yeah. You it's not as good as four players. Mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to admit, because actually, there would be, say, for example, it would be the two of us each controlling a, a, an army, and you would control both armies. You would control yeah, both yeah. red and blue, which obviously gives you a big advantage. Because you are perfectly synchronized with yourself, or you should, unless you're schizophrenic, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> you should be able to have an advantage with us. Yes. So maybe you should be the, the person that is less good at chess, or maybe you would get a handicap of a few less points. Mm -hmm. Because again, of course, you can play, you don't have to play with the same points, you can yeah. adjust based on your. I, can, I, could, I could challenge you to a game where I have a normal sure game where I play with 700 points and you play with 800. Or 900. So you, you get the opportunity to, to adjust the balances. That's a good idea, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. If, if someone's trying to learn the game, you can give them extra points to yeah. help them get into it. Exactly as you would do in a war game. Yeah. Which I'll try, I'll try, to, I'll try to humiliate them as much as possible, saying, I will beat you with 200 points. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what Daryl would do. <laughs> so, guys, thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, as I said, all the information about Taranga is in the show notes. It is on a slow boat from China that is almost here. So it with the second reprint of Shoro and the first print of Toranga will be available in store soon. We'll try to get some links to that in the show notes as well. As always, we welcome your comments. Get them down below. If you're viewing us on YouTube, go ahead, post on YouTube. Or why not hop on over to beastsofwar.com and get involved with the community we've been building over here. Or even join us on Facebook and our River House pages and Shura page and yeah. uh, come and join the action. Absolutely. Like Warren said, we'll put the links in the show notes. Mm -hmm. So uh, hop on over. Alicio, thanks again for joining us and taking us through what has been a hilariously good fun game. Thank you very I, much. I just have to say again that I enjoyed immensely yeah. beating you. <laughs> in one move. In one move. <laughs> yes. Uh, I let you win. I was uh, pushing my game, you see. Yes, yes. It was intentional. Intentional. Yes, yes. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in and keep an eye out as we keep an eye on Shuro Tranga and whatever strange names Alessio comes up with next. Loka and Yuda. Loka and Yuda. Well, you heard it here <laughs> first, folks.